my country, Mexico, had a, a very hard earthquake in 1985. And it literally hit the entire city. And it was a panic situation. And the community, it was the people that took, um, that had to, everybody had to go out. Everybody had to go and rescue a cousin of someone. And, and we just had to do it. And like the schools closed, obviously everything was destroyed. and. And, and it was the thousands of people and thousands of buildings that were affected. And that was the first time in my life that I had the feeling that I was useful. That I was, it, it, it was something big about oh, all these years I did nothing. And it's only now that it just like phew, hit me as a, oh my God. And, and, and I can continue doing it. So I basically stayed uh, with the earthquake uh, team for three weeks. Um, like a lot of, a lot of volunteers, like everybody was volunteering. So don't, don't think that I was like a hero, like everyone was volunteering, but they were going back after a couple of days or after a week. And I just got into this addiction of feeling useful and feeling that that was what, what probably um, I could do for getting that feeling back and, and just like you know like it was it was a selfish feeling it was the first time that i felt uh useful seen valuable and and so you know like i was modeling at that time and that meant nothing like all of that was like all the everything else was not as powerful of the, as the feeling that i had so i i i i, I knew that i was uh, probably going to do that for the rest of my life. Claudia is an exceptional woman. Not only is she extremely smart, and charismatic and a beautiful person, but she has also made it her life's work to save the world. She has worked for organizations like the United Nations, UNICEF, the Global Fund, and many others. But there's nothing that I can tell you that can speak louder than her actions, but today we're gonna find out what makes her excellent. We're trying to figure out who you are, right? <laughs> so let's start with that, let's start with with your development, your parents. And before you say anything, I have a question. Yeah. What does it mean to be stronger than death? <laughs> I, I can't, I, you know, like I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed your story about putting excellence together. And I, I didn't know, and, and this is just a great, a great surprise and a way, great way to be your first guest. So I feel extremely honored. So thanks. I, uh, I, I, I hardly say that phrase. I've said it a couple of times only when I feel in a very safe place. So my, my parents um, had three children and two of them, I was the middle one, and two of them died. So the two of them died. When they were exactly the same months, they were 18 months each, and they actually followed the same path path, the same development. So it was uh, a, like a genetic incompatibility between my parents that they had no idea about. So the baby simply over, uh, overdeveloped. Yeah, so yeah. instead of walking when you're one year old, my siblings and I as well started walking when they were six months. Uh, or something like that and then you know like everything was fast 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 and then they reached the nine month mark and then it was backwards oh, right. from you know like running to walking from walking to crawling from crawling to not being able to walk on like you can imagine the you know like the tragedy as parents that that was so that happened the first time and I was born and I hit the ninth month mark and then I continued growing and they said like that's fine and then they had the, the, sec the third baby and the third baby hit the nine month mark and then backwards. So I grew up under a microscope if you want, thinking, like feeling that everybody was like checking whether I was going to survive. Yeah. 
And the feeling that that gave me as a kid was that when I, you know, like every year that I was like two years old, three years old, 10 years old, then, then my, my, my family was sure that I was the strongest person in the planet because I was stronger than death. And so it gave me, it, it gave me, and, and it's very, you know, like it's a, it's a personal, very, 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 very emotional, <laughs> uh, very emotional story, but I'm happy to share it with you. But altogether, I think that it determined um, who I am and how I was brought up and how they, you know, like everybody was like, and, and then there was a change, right? Like at some point it was like, you're stronger than life, so go get it, <laughs> <laughs> so, so go figure it out. Um, yeah. That made you into something incredible. We can see, that's why that, that story is so important to me. Yeah. I needed people to know that maybe that, that had one of the impacts yeah. and made you really believe that you were gonna be who you're gonna be. Yeah. So yeah. thank you so much for, no. for sharing. Yeah, that's right. And also something that has to do with, with development is, is education. Right. And, and it's, it's really important, especially right now, that people are thinking a lot about entrepreneurship and doing your th things on your own. Um, how do you feel about education in general and also um, Sort of like formal, training and formal, formal and informal formal education. Formal education and yeah. informal. So Tell us your take. I mean, I, I, I cannot emphasize enough how that is my priority. Number one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? Because uh, like one of the, one of, I've been working on the development in, 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 in the tree hogging industry, in the you know, like, <laughs> uh, good doing industry for a long, long time. B, public health, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, children, but also refugees, but also, you know, like maternal health. And so I've been there, done that in a number of things. And, and I've seen a lot of progress in many areas, and I've seen a lot of um, stagnation in many areas. And regardless of where you see it, there are two things that are fundamental. The one is um, the, the true belief that, uh, that people belong to the same family, that we're humans. That, you know, like when you feel, when you have societies or a structure, social structures that are highly um, discriminatory, highly racist, you can't see progress. You can't see gender violence go on. You can't, it's, it's clear. Like when you see cohesive societies, like natural cohesive societies, you know, like in Brazil, there are people that are colorful, you know, like of color that are tall, that are, you know, like th then you see easier, it's easier to actually get um, progress going. And the second factor that is an indicator across is education. So if you're not talking about uh, only AIDS, for example, if you're not talking about how are you going to educate a teenager so that she doesn't become a mother, or how are you going to you know, like make sure that uh, a, a pregnant mother is educated about uh, taking care of a baby if she's positive, which is all of that is possible. So I cannot emphasize enough how much education matters to me. And I work for UNICEF. Well, I am a special advisor for UNICEF. Mm -hmm. I'm also a special advisor since I met you <laughs> and since last time I got a new job. Um, oh, wow. So I'm a special advisor for the Secretary General of Migration, which I, wow. I love and adore, and we can talk about that. But, of course. Um, but in, in terms of education, my education, I, I was so blessed by something that I was so upset about for so many years. And because of that experience, I think that I started seeing how my life could have been so different. So when I was, I think at 13, I started flirting with the idea of quitting school, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, like I, I was on the modeling scene and, and my, my, my friend said like, we're quitting, we're too good for, you know, like we're, we're, we're too good to not do it properly. And, you know, like people have to give their passion. And, and we were totally into this, like we should do this and we should quit school. And, um, and my mother, who's an actress, I thought I, I should go to my mother, who's round and an actress and she's like out there and, you know, like, except uh, contrary to my father who's square and engineer and, da, right da, da, and I was like, I'm not asking daddy, I'm asking mommy um, <laughs> about quitting school. I was like, look, let's, let's, let's make the math. Like I'm going to make more money than you in a year. And then this would continue for the next, uh, for the rest of our lives. And then we will be very happy. And you know, like, well, everything is going to be okay. And she said like over my dead body, oh, wow. you're not quitting school. 
you're like if necessary you're gonna you know like that that's going to be your hobby and if you can't deal with that then you should quit and I just saw my friend quit school and go like that like and I saw her in the you know like in the covers of the magazines oh and you know God. like and I was like <laughs> so for so many years I was like I knew I knew that I should have gone and live with my dad you know like I knew I should have gone to him and and then there was a point and it was like not not more than five years or something like that when when she started literally because education gives you growth it is the one thing that allows evolution I, I just came back from the Galapagos Island and I was seeing literally from one island to the other turtles turtles show a different neck depending on where the flower is that they have to you know go and, and catch and, and and imagine human beings so if, if you if you don't have the tools to actually continue evolving and and changing, then you're gonna stay the same way that a turtle cannot develop a, a neck to catch what it needs to eat, then will probably die. And and that experience and, and you know, like by the way, I have to say my mother was kind enough to say, like, oh okay, so you're you're lacking a little fun, no problem. So um, every time, being the actress that she is, uh, every time she signed a contract to do a theater uh, show, she said like, yeah, but there's a little clause that I would like to add, which is my daughter has to have a role as well. And so I had to play, like I had to hold the trees behind the scenes. I had to, you know, like do all these kind of things that, and I was like, mom, my friends are having, you know, like instead of being here, my friends are either sleeping, watching telly or just like doing life. And she was like, no, 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 this is for informal education. She exactly. always got informal education. And at the end it was, yeah. because it allowed me to actually see, you know, like not only what you learn in school, but open up completely the, you know, like the mindset, my, my, my informal education, my hanging the, you know, like I eventually did, a, I was inside of an armor in one of her plays for, you know, like 10 minutes. And I, I, had, I started meditating that, <laughs> you know, like there are so many things that I, I, I give credit to that period. But in general, I think that if, if we could as individuals, just make sure that education doesn't mean what you were given at the lottery of birth. That it doesn't mean that if you were born in a country, uh, in a family, and in a school that you were granted education, that you know, like if you were not there, if you did not have, if you did not win the lottery of birth, that that's the end of it. Because I just don't think that education means school. Education means learning and desire to grow and desire to actually just like open up and challenge history, your own history and say, no, 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 no. I, I know I was not born in, you know, next to Yale or where my parents could pay that for me, but that doesn't mean that I cannot you know, like learn and continue developing that muscle to, ev you know, like to do evolution. So, yeah, that's that's one of the areas where where I, I absolutely think Hispanics, for example, should just like get into that chip exactly. and, uh, and keep on growing. Yeah, you have to keep on growing and, and, and reinvent yourself, basically. And, yeah. and you have to do it. I mean, you can only do it through education, through the things that you that you get, you know, the things that you read. But you also mentioned meditation. You know, <laughs> that you are meditating in the middle of your, when you were in the armor and everything. I, ha I had to be there 27 minutes every <laughs> night inside of the armor. Oh, every night? Every night. Yeah, that sounds no, like No, no, I had to be there. And the, the joke was, it was a show called Me and My Girl. Mm -hmm. And so the joke was that it was a very rich uh, aristocratic family and everything was perfect. And in the living room was the armor along with the chandeliers and the, you know, like carpets yeah. and so on. And then they found the... El heredero, how do you say el heredero? The hair, the like inherit, the, the hair, the exactly, hair, the hair. Yeah, yeah. They found the hair who was lost and there was no one to take the family and he was a homeless person. So the moment he comes, he starts swearing and everybody goes like, ah, including the armor <laughs> that finally <laughs> wakes up and like, not yeah. wakes up, all of a sudden wakes, uh, jumps and, and leaves the stage. So that was my role. That's incredible. For a year, so 27 minutes like that, until he said like, Sh something, ah, and then I had to go. So I, I actually had nothing else to do. Exactly. But <laughs> started like using that time. So um, meditation is one of the things that I, I, I think I am most grateful um, for the habits that I have and for, for being able to, it's almost like this, 
like like that. Um, it's ha it has given me permission to look at life as if it would be part of a television instead of like my life and suffer it so much it's like oh okay i see there's some drama out there there's some lights out here and so on so i i, I cannot be more grateful for um for having incorporated meditation do you, in my do life. you find meditation from from chopra from the impact chopra or so i i had a uh, <laughs> the questions you're asking me so i had a rebellious i had a I, I, it was complicated with me and meditation but for um a number of years i was um uh, I was I, I was very constant and I was l loving it and at some point I started just using it losing it when I started getting busy yeah. um, I started losing it and I was doing a lot of things at the same time so in the last years where I was in Mexico I was doing a master's degree at the same time as my last degree in college and I was modeling like so I I started just doing crisis meditation and at some point I said, I'm, that's it, I'm not gonna meditate anymore, I'm a cardio girl. So I started doing, you know, like running and 20 minutes also I go, whatever it is. And, and I had a rebellious relationship with meditation and then Deepak uh, brought me back to it. Um, at some point I, um, not, so, not so long ago, he, um, Deepak, Deepak said like, listen, just give me Give me a year. Just give me one year in which you can just like try it again. And I went for uh, three times during a year for a week to uh, either a retreat or a university course. And I mean, like the first time I, I retake, I, I'd like I left it. I sort of like crisis meditated and then I came back to it. And the first time was for a week, eight hours a day. So it was like an intense uh, comeback. And, uh, and I cannot be more grateful because that's basically um, my energy provider, either nature or, or meditation. And when I can have them both, then it's amazing. It's, it's even more. Exactly. That's, that's so great because actually meditation, you know, there are some studies. And by studies, I mean uh, books by Tim Ferriss, which he, he interviews as many hyper performers as, as he can. Yeah. And he has said that meditation is one of Constant. of the things that are across the line. Everybody who's doing great things in the world, they're meditating. Like oh, that's okay. that's hands down it's gonna happen. But besides meditation, you know, and I'm I'm glad you mentioned it, what other what other habits do you have that you feel keep you keep you going, they keep you energized and they keep you proactive? So I want to back it up just with a little, with a little sort of like um, background since I started, you know, like talking about my parents and my upbringing. And I did mention my father being such a like literally square person. And like I said 10 o'clock and I was like, it's, it's 10 or one. Yeah, but that's not 10 o'clock, you know, like he, and in Mexico. So you can imagine that. Yeah. And my mother being totally like, oh, uh, we said 10 o'clock and it's one o'clock. Yeah, it's like 10, one, you know, like. And, and all together, I think that I had patchy habits. Uh, you know, like when I started working, I was not the, I didn't have all the toolkit. You know, like if, if, I, if, I, if I had to repair a wall, I didn't have like the, oh yeah, let me take the great organization skills tools, the, you know, like tool or like the planning or the priority setting. I, I was not equipped enough. So I, 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 I hit the wall a number of times. Yeah. And it was only because I think a sense of persistence that and I, I, and, and, and promise and good lo and, and good not good luck. I think that I, generosity of my uh, employers that they didn't sack me a number of times because I was like either late or you know like um, or, or I, I, I didn't put enough quality into things and um, or I got passion too passionate about like a, a couple of other things. So by m for me creating habits was my survival kit was my way to compensate the things that I didn't get. Um, at first hand uh, by you know like by of growing so I, I, I started actually realizing that um, being more square than round for my habits was uh, was a good thing and that I was going to take my round side for the creative side of my life where I could actually expand onto 
uh, into creation or packaging and so on. So, so basically, you were you were creating structure. Structure into your life. I was creating. I, I needed to create structure because I hit the wall far too many times, and I just didn't want to continue that path. So what I realized is that having quotas for me was important. So I said, like, okay, I need to. Uh, make sure that, and I start like I, you have no idea, and I still have the notebooks and so on about like trying because we didn't have internet at that time. I just couldn't check YouTube of like like time planning or you know like time management and let's like priority setting. Um, I just had to try system after system after system, and one of the things that um, helped me is to talk to people. I was like, okay, I'm. I'm I'm coming out about like my need to create habits that would allow me to be better. And people said like, you know what, I would like to create habits too. I, I, and that, that fact helped me to sit down, you know, like with my Thai friend, uh, Fon, who I adore. And, uh, and we, we clashed a lot because she was very on time and I was very on lack of time. And when, when I said like, I need to create a system to improve, she was like, yes, yes, let's work on that one. Let's, let's do that. I sit next to you and uh, you deliver late, let's do this. And, and with a number of other friends. And so all together by, 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 by taking it, by owning it, by accepting it, by saying like, okay, let's, how do I do this? How do I do a better version of Claudia? Uh, so that I can just like compensate for the things that I didn't have by uh, my, my upbringing. Then it got me to understand the things that I could do, which is I, I started at the beginning losing myself and saying like, I'm going to be very Swiss. Now I'm, everything is on time. And, I'm, and I, that was not me either. You know, like I'm, 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 I'm both. I was born into, like if I would be a fruit, I would probably be a square watermelon. You know, that, <laughs> that, that would be my nature. So in reality, I had to face it. I had to accept it and I had to uh, deal with it. So I started thinking that my habits had to be uh, very linear and very strict and very, um, uh, very quantifiable. So I'm very quota driven. So I'm like six times a week, I will have, and I, I can tell you that, but I like six times a week, I have, to, I, I exercise six times a week. I meditate seven times a week. I wake up sometimes uh, far too early according to my husband, but, um, but in reality, then I, w what I need every day is I need to put things into perspective at, at least 20 minutes. So I med meditation does that for me. Um, the other thing that does that for me is jogging. Uh, but I can't jog all the time and you know, like I wouldn't jog here even if you, you know, like it would be to, to save my life. But, um, but also, like similar things that just put, put your mind out, I need at least six times, a, uh, seven times a week. Six times a week I need to sweat because sweating actually allows me for, <laughs> to do anger management and also to get things a little bit more into, you know, like, like to, to, to learn how to breathe as in like, <laughs> blow it out and, and, and take it down. I revise what I have to do every day in the morning and I close the day by checking, did, did, I, did I get the, main, the big pieces? And then can I see what I have to do the day after? And then I, I, I sometimes think that my, uh, by doing that, my, my mind is so kind, my brain, that it does a lot of thinking <laughs> in the night while I'm like, well, I'm asleep, my brain is probably not. And then I wake up with a sense of like, oh, okay, so I have a sense of what I need to do or what I want to achieve and so on. Um, I check in with myself in the morning and I check in with myself before going to bed. And, and how, how do you do that? Do you use a notepad? Do you use some type of... Everything. I have, I have like my, I'm, 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 I, I look like a kid with the game because I'm like always taking notes, but it's just like a reminder to myself, I take notes, I, you know, like if I would have a pen, I probably would write in your trousers and so <laughs> on, just like um, about like taking to do's and I love it. I'm so happy to have come out as an anal obsessive compulsive person that I am as in like, oh yeah, you know, like I will not hesitate to check on the details 20 times. I love crossing lists, like check, check, done, done. And that is something that it's great to accept who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, like who, who, who I am, I get pleasure about doing lists and crossing them because it gives me a sense of achievement. Therefore, I will do lists and I will actually continue doing that because that makes me feel effective. And the more effective I am, the probably the easier it is to work with me and, 
and get things done. The other thing that um, someone told me once, and I really think that has been uh, very good for me, and I'm trying to put it to my kids as much as I can, is actually checking, um, not checking, congratulate like at night like have a have a moment of that was amazing like actually you know like having like probably tonight i'm gonna go to bed and i'm like actually that conversation having taken the decision to um i'm going tomorrow to a 15 day tour london berlin madrid paris davos and so on so for me to come here tonight was you know like a commitment and nevertheless i'm gonna go to bed tonight and to bed and say like that was amazing it was an amazing decision. It was an amazing conversation. Well done. So, you know, like I, you give yourself a little bit of a pat on the, on back, the back and say yeah. like, you're doing good because people need to, the mind needs to believe it's in the side of progress, not in the side of failure. Exactly. So every time you put yourself on the side of, shoot, I didn't do that. Uh, yeah, it, it's be, it, 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 it actually takes down the energy. And if you say like, wow, I managed that one. Yeah. Uh, then you put yourself into a, it's into an, an, in a position of energy into jumping yes. into the next one. That's, that's incredible. Um, I'm glad that you were talking about everything that makes you proactive and active, but the real enemy for everyone, and hopefully you also can relate, is procrastination. Oh yeah. So right. what, what things do you do to, to combat it? Like how do you, how do you avoid procrastination? How do you make yourself um, proactive and if you want to give examples like go ahead but everybody's gonna relate I I don't know anybody that naturally is not um, at least in some areas um, procrastinating one way or the other and it's mm -hmm. uh, so, so we, I, I think that everybody has a, a reason and an area at least that I know mm -hmm. and what what makes when I get to when I feel that there is something that could touch me or you know when something is emotional for example for me or when I have to go to an area of my emotions that I don't necessarily want to go to then I start like pushing it and saying like oh my god didn't I have to do like 10 or 10,000 other things before doing that oh yeah mm -hmm. exactly like and and for example when I uh, in the world where I live um, which is the humanitarian world, there are things that that you are able to deal with better than yeah. others. So I started um, talking about the people that work next to me, uh, saying like, L listen, let's make a deal. You know, like I have, a, I, 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 I want to tell you, there are certain things that I really leave behind because I just I either feel that I'm not going to do it well or you know, it's going to expose me or because it hurts me. And then, then what you need to know, and for example, for people like my team, is like, I, I just need to be prompted. And I have mm -hmm. to actually sit down and say like, okay, let's help me by having a coffee with me, sitting, it down, sitting down, and let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. But it is, it, it is only because I had the, the opportunity to have the other experience that I was able to sort of like turn it around. Yeah. Some, Any some, techniques? Yes. So again, one of them is is, is putting myself, uh, you know, like deadlines and alarms with others. Deadlines. So, but yeah, I, I, I doing it on my own sometimes is not going to help. Or simply like trading, as in like, you do that, I'll do that. You know, I'll do something else for you. You know, like particularly for people. Make a <laughs> like, deal. Exactly. Like, listen, I just don't feel like doing that letter or something like that and that they, they are like laughing because that's true I, I can't write to that person but i'll take care of all the other things that we were like mm -hmm. um so by by accepting that i am having an issue as opposed to hiding it um i think that that's a great technique when you are able to confront that yeah i know that i am having an issue with it exactly. is the best technique that i found by repeating again, and just because of the of the, what, what we were talking about, the brain, mm -hmm. by putting it on your to-do list one day, and then the other, and then the next month, and then the other, and then the other, you're just making yourself feel uh, like a loser that you're not, only because mm -hmm. you're not able to do, deliver one area. Mm -hmm. And it probably is related to fear more than anything else. Now, mm -hmm. let me tell you, I don't think that procrastination is negative only. I think that there is some part of the brain that is wise. Yeah. and that is protecting you from you know like or protecting you from delivering something and i think that 
when when you feel like you know what i'm too tired to do something i have to rest or i need to take a walk or something like that there must be something that your body's telling you your uh your brain is telling you about like take perspective take take a deep breath mm -hmm. and then come back to it because you might actually have a different take than you would have the first time around that's very interesting that's a very interesting take on, on procrastination because everybody is just looking at it from a point of view of oh no you gotta stay away but maybe you know your brain i mean genetically is trying to save you from from dying of starvation or whatever so it's like a like a trigger that happens uh it's very interesting that you mentioned uh deadlines because there's this guy called um tim urban he has a ted talk that everybody should check out about uh procrastination and about a monkey mind you know that's the procrastinator it's you and the monkey mind and the monkey you you want to do something very productive and the monkey is like no 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 no, no. we're gonna we're gonna do this we're gonna play video games or we're gonna just go do fun stuff and you have that conversation with the monkey the monkey always wins 100 percent of the time what happens is that if there is a deadline the panic monster shows up and the panic monster is the only one that can take care of the of the monkey the monkey just leaves right away and it's very interesting that one of the techniques that, that you mentioned has some so much to do with that. It's like whenever you have a deadline, then you get things done. And it's like, it looks like just doing stuff on your own without having a deadline, without having others, um, seems a little hard. So I'm, I'm very glad that you also mentioned that you get, you get help. No, but I mean, like there's, uh, now that we're gonna talk yeah, about it, yeah. now that we're into addictions, um, there is the there is a sense of um, deadline as in panic, but think about it in the other way around. Like the the brain and the body also is uh, like loves adrenaline. Yeah. And so it is not that you know like I take my own procrastination because I know that I am scared of doing things that might expose me, might you know like. Uh, scare me my you know like make me feel emotional or something um, but there is another part to be said about like not doing it so that you have the rush of yes. doing it the last minute because it produces adrenaline it's like people like uh, literally my mom i was so sure that she had this addiction because i was like why are you sitting down if you have like a deadline in 10 minutes and and the the, the appointment is one hour away from here uh-huh and not like that's it <laughs> it's the addiction baby it's the addiction you know like Adren it's kicking in junkie. it's like you really want to have like a fix right like of like <laughs> can i make it can i make it you know like people that don't go to the airport really really early because they just want the to see what but it's the adrenaline and the fact that you're like i made it exactly. i nailed it. you know like i win i win all the time and that mechanism is so dangerous it's so great, <laughs> it's so great to recognize it because I am like that. I'm always, you know, like I was always on the line, like yeah, 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 with the teachers, like trying to see, you know, like, eh, can I make it like, like, I took challenges only to see what I can make them and, you know, like uh, on the personal challenge. And I recognized that that was an addiction that maybe it's hard to get away, they don't you know, like defeat, but at the same time, I, I said, like, if I continue doing that, literally, I'm going to lose the plane, which is a waste of money, right? Like, uh, like and uh, my boyfriend might be scared, you know, like upset on the other side of the, you know, like <laughs> the island all alone out there. So how do you actually change trade addictions to make sure that you make it? And so you can start doing sports or you can start doing things that are more productive that allow you to continue in your growth path uh, and not actually get on the way. That's so great. Um, so let's talk about something that you actually mentioned. It was a little word that's very important for, uh -oh. for anyone that wants to be something and that sometimes gets put down. And I'm going to try not to make it too complicated. So what is luck? Right. Uh, as you can tell, um, I talk a lot about the brain. And the reason why I speak a lot about the brain is because early childhood development with my job at UNICEF and I got really um, into understanding whether you are born because of your genetics. You are you because of your genes, uh, genes, genes. Your gems. Because your gems. Your gems. <laughs> You're you because of your gems. Because your gems. Um, exactly, genetics. 
Uh, no, is it whether you're you because of your genetics or is it the environment, right? Like the leader, born or made. And I started getting into understanding, like, what, who, 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 and, and the entire, not only me, like, neuro, the entire neuroscience is right now into something that is called epigenetics, which tells that, no, actually, everything that they say about, like, a, a person is who they are because of genetics is banana land. The, it is demonstrated that it, the environment plays an incredible role Definitely. into that. And so you can have, um, and, and even at the physical level, watch out, even at the physical level, uh, you might actually be today not only an accident of history, uh, you are who you are because of the environment where you were. Mm -hmm. And the third element is determination, is character building, is who you make th of that. And I think that is very similar to luck. Yes. Some people are lucky because they were born into a place that had no crisis, the parents are amazing, and you know, like the, the father is the father, the mother is the mother, and they have no phantoms, and you know, like it's totally mm -hmm. functional, and they have nutrition and school, and they are educated and all that, and, and that's lucky. Mm -hmm. And that produces the luck of the luck of the luck. Um, and, 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 but then the people have to make their own luck um, and, and work on it. I think that it is the triangle that I find very similar um, of what, you know, like I think genetics are and the human being is constructed by. That's great. If you think that getting lucky by getting punched, I mean, getting punched is being lucky, you just get on the ring, you'll get punched, mm -hmm. right? You created mm -hmm. your luck. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand that one, but <laughs> 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 all yeah, right. So, one one of the principles of self development that were brought up by Napoleon Hill, uh, who wrote Think and Grow Rich. Has anybody read that book or heard of it? Yes. Amy Sam. You got it right now. I listen to the audio all the time. Exactly. So the mastermind principle is when two or more people uh, get together and work for one vision. Mm -hmm. How ha have you made um, partnerships? And give us some examples of things that you have accomplished that you know for a fact that they're great and they cannot be done just by one person without a team. I mean, I think that I wanna talk about the, um, I wanna talk about the project that I'm going to launch tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, it is the podcast, the Global Goals Cast, and it is the, the entire thing is a partnership. Not only my podcast, which is a, like a tiny piece on the equation, but the Global Goals, as a fact, are a master plan. Can I tell you what the what the Global Goals this is? is your and what show. Is it? Like, excellent. So thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, in 2015, the United Nations launched the Sustainable Development Goals, which are 17 goals that were debated and agreed by 193 countries. Is the most is the the most historic agreement signed by everybody uh, over the last 200 years, because it took five years for these 193 countries to agree on what is our master plan of action to save the world and save our planet. And after five years of debate, we launched it in 2015. And this master plan of the universe is a, 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 p a masterpiece, but not only that, it is the plan that we have. And, and there's no plan B, uh, but there's no planet B either. So we really have to make sure that this plan is made and achieved and and it's our right you know like in that plan citizens know that they have the right to have education and health and be safe and not be harassed and and have you know like and have a planet where you or have a city or a place where rivers exist and there are trees and we're not killing everything so i am the most fond of making this plan work and 
I, I cannot tell you how much I think it is our measuring stick as citizens, particularly when governments are failing us so much all the time. Plans like that are the only hope that we have. And it is only through partnership. It is only when uh, private sector makes it part and when civil society get, makes it part and with citizens actually, each of us know it's not only my right to have an education, but it's also my obligation to make sure that I'm not littering, that I'm not, you know, like taking showers that are like 15 hours instead of 15 minutes or five mm -hmm. minutes or so on. So I am like absolutely, all my anal compulsive neurotic, you know, I am flowing in this master plan. I love it to pieces and, and what, uh, what it was, it's a mastermind. It's, exactly. it's having so many minds saying, we can do three things. Of all those 17 goals, we can do three things. Um, we can be the first generation, and we can be the first generation that will eradicate extreme poverty for the world. We are the last generation that can mitigate the impact of climate change before it's too late, and we can do it for all. So for me, this is like a, the most incredible creation that I have seen. And what I'm launching tomorrow is a podcast that will talk about the progress that people are making, the celebration. What you're doing is celebrating heroes. I'm trying to do the same for the people that are making uh, progress on the global goals, whether they know that they are global goals or not. It doesn't matter. People are making progress. The world is getting better. If you would be a baby and you would have to, you know, like floating in the sky saying like, in what period of time I would be born? This would be the only the moment where you wanted to be born because there's no better place. There's no better moment than this moment in history to be a girl, to be able to have education, to be able to actually have uh, the amount of, you know, like equality, even though we're in a very unequal world. So for me, launching this podcast, and again, you know, like I'm Mexican, I, I talk to Siri and say like, Siri, dear all, uh, dictate a, you know, dictate a, an email. Dear all, I would like to, and it's like two note, da 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 da. I would like, Siri, we're going to talk about tequila, uh, to kill a mockingbird, tequila mockingbird. So, like, I have a challenge already, you know, like in me, like, my, my, and I'm doing a podcast. I'm exposing myself in big time because I have no idea whether, like, I am pretty sure that 10% of, you know, like my friends that said like, hey, yeah, yeah, sure, it's just send me an email because they have no idea what I said, you know. Like, <laughs> so I'm, I'm massively putting myself in a vulnerable place by doing a podcast where I don't know whether people are, under, are going to understand what I say or not. But it doesn't matter because I think that a couple of people said we just have to do it. We just have to tell the stories of progress because we need to celebrate good news. Everybody's closing down from, from bad news. Everybody's shutting it down. They can't absorb it anymore because it's not true. There is a great deal of hope and there's a great deal of beauty and color out there that we have to catch and celebrate. And that's what actually keeps me, you know, like going and, and not only it was m my team and, and other people that do like on the close circle, we started getting UNICEF and the World Food Program and the United Nations. And all of a sudden we have an entire universe that captures more than 100 million people waiting for the launch tomorrow. And that I call a mastermind. That's beautiful. <laughs> Tell us about the people that you look up to, because we, including me, you know, everybody <laughs> looks up to you. So who are your heroes? Oh, uh, my heroes, wow. Okay, so let's see. I think that, <laughs> Okay, can I can I break it into two or three? This is your I, I I I have a very strong vertical sense of hero. So my grandmother is the probably the hero of my life and the hero of many people. I mean she she did have a huge family, but beyond that, she had a huge impact in her community. So my grandmother is my hero because she never, 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 ever, ever gave up. She always tried, and I mean it, I mean like at the end of the day, she was 80, 80 years old. She had arthritis, like there's, like she, she could, like she was like a spider. 
and she started taking guitar lessons on her 80th, 80th birthday. She literally was like, I'm not gonna, you know, like she just went on for life, for everything. And I think that for that, she's my hero because she, she gave us that uh, huge chance. And then my mother, and again on the line, my mother is my absolute hero. She, you know, like I told you the story about like the two children my mother lost. And instead of taking that, and I, I don't know what I would have done, probably like, I, like people would have in those situations just like go into like depression, criminality, drugs, I don't know. And instead she said like, I'm gonna go and um, she was a professional basketball player and, and um, part of the national team. And she decided to study economy as an occupational therapy and from there she said like you know what i did i now i'm an economist i'm gonna work in economy actually this is the most boring thing i've ever done in my life now i'm gonna quit economy and then i'm going to you know she could and she became an actress when she was 40 or something like that which is she is my hero because she's not scared of living life fully and just like going for it and and teaching me and, and, and a bunch of other people that, yeah, you aim higher. You, you only live once. Why would you like to live halfway through when, when, when that's it, right? Like, why would you say, like, stay in, in a job that you hate if, if this is the one life you have? And, and my vertical line goes with my daughter. I, I, I think that she's literally an inspiration for me. She's such a hero. I see, uh, I see a lot of what's happening in the world reflected in my daughter. She's, she is like the youth today, that, the youth that I want to see as well. They are not going to wait for anybody to take action on the things that they don't think it's right. They are not going to wait for a government or an institution to come and fix education. She started working with this company called Nalu, who's like that, that by, by the way, was started by a 16 year old. So it's not that, and, and she started the company when she was 13. And so they, uh, they started this fashion company that creates uh, t-shirts and sweatshirts and backpacks. And for every four products that they sell, they are able to buy or afford a uniform for a kid in Indonesia, India, and in those countries, actually in India and in British colonies, they have this stupid legislation, to be honest, and so like dated, you would agree, that has kids have, oh, uniforms are obligatory. And the government in some instances, like in India, they pay, on, they pay for the uniform until the children are 12, but then they stop. And so if the kids don't have the money to continue paying for the uniform, the kids cannot go to school. And if you're a mother of nine kids and uh, a uniform is in the way, then either the kid goes to work in a factory or the girl gets married and so on. So this 13 year old realized that she created this company, started selling, co like Tamara was and said, like, I'm gonna be your ambassador. And they are going in March to Indonesia to deliver their first 10,000 uniforms for children that they have That's sold incredible. them. So, like, it's crazy. Uh, you, you totally want to admire how not only the Tamara, my daughter, she's totally an, like she is an inspiration for me, but also she is a reflection of what we can hopefully see in the future. Now, you asked about hero, so that's my vertigo. Yes. Now I have another hero. Go ahead. Uh, my hero is uh, no, like uh, Richard is trying to see whether it's him. Uh, no, uh, my he is my absolute hero, but I, I I'm thinking of Frida Kahlo, and I she is my hero for reasons that I know people don't, like it's totally controversial. I love her because the way that she decided to love Diego, um, which is, you know, like the story of Frida and Diego is super complex, intense. Diego left her, they, they, they were divorced two times, they married again, and there was this competition in a party to say like there was a French lady who was very pretty and everybody says like the person that is able to drink tequila the longest seconds is going to kiss the French lady. So Frida basically won the competition so that she would kiss the ladies 
to avoid seeing Diego kissing her. Wow. That's the level. That, that's that's the level of love and devotion. She was like, I love you despite of everything that everybody says, and I love you because I want to love you, and that's that's my story. And I I think that Frida Kahlo for her survival, her perseverance, for her uh, decision to love unconditionally, she's my hero. That's incredible. I think Frida is a lot of women's hero, and you know there's things about her that people can see in you, I'm sure. And since I moved to America, I just moved to America three years ago, and one of the persons that I've been, and I, I wouldn't consider her a hero, but that I really have a deep admiration for is someone that I knew before, but now that I'm in America, I, I get to see more, which is Ariana Huffington. And she has built uh, on her own as a woman and she's so clever, and I love that. And that I admire the persistence, the, admir the, the cleverness, but also the kindness in the way of building those emporiums. So her idea was like, everybody wants to be seen and everybody wants to see each other. And so she built the Huffington Post based on that premise of everybody should see uh, and, and, and build that. And now Thrive is based on the idea of sleep. Um, and she created a, a, a theory saying like sleep is good for you, created a book, went around, um, did conferences, made herself an authority on sleep, just as an entry to uh, change the way that we're living, to really start saying that we don't have to run, uh, run ourselves down to the floor working 23 hours a day because that's not life. Living is being able to have a life where you can sleep and be healthy and, and share with people and do other things. And she's building an emporium, you know, like on that premise, on the premise that sleep is good. And that and is Thrive. Th that is Thrive. Thrive Global is an organization that is trying to um, highlight heroes that are in the mindful world. So how do you do it running and jogging and how do you keep fit? How do you keep how do you disconnect from your phone? How do you? So we started. We started exploring. Actually, our wedding was an, an an attempt to you know like to see how do you do your big milestones in life, trying to be stress free. How do you enjoy the the the, the big moments of your life? And I am delighted actually that I, uh, tomorrow as well we're going to announce that I'm the new editor at large of Thrive Global. But the intention there is to provide a platform for Latinas, for Hispanics, that we're going to be launching in Spanish uh, later in the year. So I'm just <laughs> boring the lead there, you know, it's just like giving, giving it away. But the idea is that we all need to grow. We all need to share our struggles and our challenges and our experiences when we're self-developing. And, uh, and, and that's why I am so th I'm so thrilled to be part of Thrive. That's incredible, Claudia. What is it? There is something about you that I'm, I'm trying to grasp and I'm trying to, to describe it. And that something is putting you in UNICEF, working with the Global Fund, wo working with now with, with Thrive, Hispanic size. Everything, every, there's something about you driving you, putting you here in, in excellent, you know, having you as part of our mission. Tell us what that is what is that essence what is your your mission hmm. cool <laughs> take those questions right like yeah. <laughs> let's start with uh, how do you survive that and like you yeah. um look i i think that anger anger yeah. is the the main thing and i was i was lucky enough to be born in a privileged environment where I was not surrounded by bombs that were, um, you know, like destroying my procrastinating my, my house, and were no, not procrastinating. Real bombs. The, the the places where I work, they are bombs, and the schools are shut down, and so on. So I was lucky to be able to be born in a country that was peaceful, in a family that was able to shelter me and nourish me, and I get really, really upset with the lottery of birth with why um, some people have and ha don't have, like some others don't, only because they happen to be born in one place and in one country and what time. So that fundamental 
issue upsets me even more when people don't realize how lucky they are. The ones that are like in, in, in a lucky place that have uh, access to everything, how lucky that is and how privileged they are and how grateful they should be every day and thinking life and, and, and blessing every moment that they have, you know, like the opportunity to be with family and have two hands and have two uh, legs. And I think that what we need to realize is that we're all one family. This is, this is, this is it. You were, uh, what, what happens, you know, like what happens to a human being in one end of the corner doesn't make you a different human being only because you were lucky to be part of, you know, like of, 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 of be born in a, in a diff we are one single human family. When, there, when there's an earthquake, do you really think that Mother Nature makes those distinctions that we do in saying like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna go and touch those that did, uh, didn't go to school and those that did not have uh, meat for breakfast that we're gonna be, no, that's it. We're gonna take them all, take your fingerprint, put your fingerprint there, that's us. That's our humanity. And I am really upset we're forgetting our humanity that we belong to the human family. It's almost like if the seals that Richard liked so much, we're already forgetting that they are seals and we start behaving like penguins. No, we are humans and we have to go back to that sense. And that's why I think that I'm involved in uh, a, a, number of a, a number of places and organizations to try to go back to that human to that humanity so that in a couple of years time, the same way that probably, maybe not you because you're too young, but some mm -hmm. of us uh, were, were rem maybe remember how it was possible to smoke in a restaurant or even in a plane a couple of years ago where it was cool to smoke and now it's like socially rejected and absolutely condemned and it's so not cool to smoke and it's so forbidden by legislation and normative uh, places. I want that for racism. I want that for people to say like, oof, that's not, that's not cool. Not cool. Oh no, we, we are all human, right? Like we it's are so not all cool. human. I've we been are, waiting so for that line cool. all night. I want, <laughs> 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 I want to make sure that we remember that we're all human and one of the demonstrations of that is that like cigarette, being racist is absolutely socially condemned. Everyone, I know that, like me, you understand that this is an amazing woman. And to make it even more amazing, I want to ask you a quick question. Mm -hmm. If you were the goddess of anything in the world, like a Greek goddess, <laughs> you look like one, but let's say that you are one. <laughs> what would that be? Oh, um, hmm. I think I would go for justice. Um, I would go for a big sword that would actually just like be a reminder. Uh, I think that I would, that would be my, that would be my choice. Go for just making sure that we, you, you know, like, yeah, I think that fairness is an acquired taste. It's not a natural of human beings. Yes. Um, and I would go for that. And like try to find the fairness. Yeah. And finally, to find that fairness in a way, let's give us a line of contract for, for the people watching here, everybody, everybody here. Give us one line in the contract of fairness of, of the ideal that if you were, let's say, a queen and we were your knights, all your knights have to make a signature under that line. Uh, so, dear people <laughs> <laughs> of the world, in order to be knighted in our kingdom, you uh, need to outgrow the sense that it's only okay to be tolerant because tolerance is, is not good enough. Imagine a world where we can actually be accepting and be loving to each other. So to be a knight, you need to make sure that you treat each other respectfully and as human beings that we are and that you elevate yourself from only being able to be tolerant to be uh, human with each other. Everyone here from, thank you. Thanks for her. Everyone here who, who's visiting us in the, in, the, in the set, the whole staff, House 39, Claudia, obviously. You don't understand how much you just put into by being here, by allowing us to make this program possible. And the incredible 
miracle that it is for me to have Claudia in, the, in this show, to have each and every one of you here. You would not believe how blessed I am, how blessed the Hispanic community is, and how blessed the American community is, and how blessed humans are for this conversation that everybody, including Claudia, um, are allowing. So I want to thank you from, from the bottom of my heart for coming and for making this pos possible. And I want you all to enjoy your night. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. So much. Thank you.